Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 161st episode of Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. Obviously, you've seen the posters and our publicity materials. This will be the very first episode of what we want to call like a new dialogue series called the Health Leadership in Action or Health Lead for short. Health Lead is an international dialogue series on groundbreaking health initiatives by visionary leaders who take bold action, conceptualize, and develop to promote the use of technology for information exchange and international understanding. Thank you for continuing to be part of our credible online community and to all those who have just discovered us for today. Welcome po at sana po marami po kayong matutunan in our webinar for today. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of National Telehealth Center, National Institute of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. Always a pleasure to be with all of you during our regular Friday. So obviously we have a little bit of a change, uh, but uh, we are very, very grateful that you continue to be part of our regular Fridays po. And I always look forward to Fridays because I get to share hosting duties with a beloved mentor, a dear friend, also our adjunct research faculty at the National Telehealth Center. And also, more importantly, the official nominee of the Philippines and Guam to the World Health Organization's Western Pacific Region Director Post. A unifying vision for a unifying leadership. Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie. Hi, good afternoon, Raymond, and good afternoon to everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. Great to see all of you, have you here, even if it's a very rainy day here in, um, in Manila. And I'd like to greet all of you who are with us on Zoom, those of you who are watching on Facebook page, on the TVUP Facebook page, on the UP System Facebook page, on the Stop COVID Deaths Facebook page, and also TVUP Signal Channel 101. So we are on multiple platforms. And um, as Raymond has mentioned, we're, we're launching a new format for something different today. This is going to be the first in a series of um, global discussions. And we have in attendance representatives from different countries who are interested in hearing about what has been learned in other parts of the world. And so we are looking really at COVID-19 conflict and climate changes. Key issues that we, we want to hear more about and we want to hear from the leaders of different countries. So anyway, we have, um, let's see, I think we have a intro video. You want to introduce that, Raymond? You're on mute. Sorry. Thank you so much, Dr. Susie. So um, as mentioned by Dr. Susie, we have this um, introduction video uh, that we've prepared. Uh, and uh, hopefully this is something that everyone will uh, get an appreciation po. And really the trying to spur on with regards to our international dialogue that's intended for health workers, doctors, nurses, community health workers, teachers, and trainers in preparing for massive calamities. Uh, go ahead, TVP.
Okay, wonderful. Oh my goodness, that, that, that was so interesting. All right. So in this pilot episode of Health Lead, our topic is health leadership in emergencies. And we are featuring some of the leaders in our region, beginning with the Philippine Secretary of Health, Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, who is an expert in disaster management and emergency medicine. We will have Guam's governor, the Honorable Lourdes Leon Guerrero, who's a nurse by profession, but is a community leader in the North Pacific. Dexter Kishida, who is a, the one of the experts in food security of Hawaii and climate resiliency. And he is head of the Plant Industry Administration and deputy chair of the Board of Agriculture. And we, we are also joined by former Health Secretary Pauline Ubial, who was also on the ground during Haiyan. So I think we are looking forward to a um, very interesting discussion today. Raymond, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Uh, just so everyone, especially for those who are just joining us for today, <clears throat> Health Lead is a webinar series that will be focusing on skills and insights needed to achieve greater resiliency in the face of adversity. It will still be uh, continue to be produced by TVUP and the University of the Philippines, but it will be in collaboration with the Philippines Department of Health, specifically the Bureau of International Cooperation. Now, to set our discussion into context, we will watch this short documentary video on public health emergencies produced by the TVUP team. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation. Super Typhoon Noir already hitting and affecting Guam. And the worst conditions yet to come, I spoke to the American Red Cross to see how they're preparing for the aftermath. Guam have been deteriorating for the past few hours as the massive and deadly super typhoon Mawar makes landfall. Trees are coming. Yeah, which is also a hot spot for tourists. <laughs> but at the top of the slope started tumbling down onto others below. Really understand it until you actually Toppled trees and flooded low-lying areas. It's believed Cyclone Gita is the worst. The road, um, there's a lot of um, uh, corrugated iron that people can... ...and the fight against MERS. The government has repeatedly called for car. South Korean president visited the heart of the MERS response operation. Along with the team, perfection and ambulance driver is a worrying new development. And All across northern Japan, it's from these vantage points on hills and in tall buildings, the largest quake ever known in Japan and one of the five largest. That May 18th came and uh, now with this development, Singapore. Nananatili pa rin ang alert level 5 sa mga pinatulong. Gayunpaman, umabot sa higit $250 million ang tinatayang kalaganan ng... Oh my goodness, Raymond. I mean, watching that in two minutes is really... Uh, makes you hold your breath a little bit. Mm. When you watch the news today, these are the things that we're seeing. We're seeing multiple emergencies which ultimately impact on health. And, and I think, um, well, thank you, TVUP, for that and for reminding us of how wide, widespread this is. So, Raymond, I think you have some housekeeping before we go to our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Susie. For all those who are asking, health lead web for all, for all health lead webinar attendees, we will still be sending certificates of attendance uh, only to those who will request it. Po, no? uh, but So please send your an email request to softcovid that's at up.edu.ph. For all of our 160 webinars, we've already sent out certificates of attendance. So 
If you feel you should have received but did not, please email us at stopcovidets at up.edu.ph. Dr. Susie? Yeah, okay. So just for, for background for those who are joining us for the first time, Raymond and I have been doing this webinar for 161 times. So <laughs> every week uh, with the help of TVUP and um, Philippine General Hospital and University of the Philippines in general, uh, we have been able to bring webinars, reaching out to people, especially to frontliners, to health workers, to bring everyone up to speed on um, the latest developments. I understand that there are people who are who are attending from different parts of, of the world, and Raymond will probably do a, a little bit of a shout out later. But we are going to tackle health emergencies in this first episode, and so let us start. We're going to have a standard panel discussion. We don't have a fun quiz today because we want to give more time to our speakers. And it is my honor to introduce our very first speaker who is considered the disaster management expert of the country. He's a trauma surgeon, very well known in his field, and one of the people who helped set up Stop COVID Deaths, which is now morphing into Health Lead, Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, Secretary of Health in the Philippines. Ted, welcome. Thank Thank you, Susie, and uh, welcome. I I love the new format, uh, international dialogue, health lead, and of, of course, congratulations to TVUP, to DOH Bureau of International Health Cooperation for taking on this international dialogue on health and leadership. C can I talk? Can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, go, go, Yes, go, go ahead, Secretary. So uh, I'm sharing my slides. Uh, is it visible? Yes, if you can just go to slideshow. Sure. Yeah, wait. Slide show. So, so this panel is covering my... There's okay. my... Okay, that's good. Wait, something wrong. Okay. So that's... Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's really a great opportunity to talk about a lifetime of experience. I'm 65 years old, 40 years in the field of emergencies and disasters and really to to encapsulate that in 10 minutes is harder than handling the hardest emergency that we can have but to tell you about myself for those who don't know me in the last COVID-19 I was a special advisor of the National Task Force I've become member of the board of PhilHealth the National Health Insurance Corporation I've been, been an executive vice president of the University of the Philippines I've been a convener of a huge multi-specialty COVID-19 pandemic response team of the, of the academics and the scientists. I've been undersecretary of the Department of Health, been a regional director of the Center for Health Development of Metro Manila, and also a member of a sub-cabinet cluster on national, of the National Security Council. And I've also been the lead for a Center for Public-Private Partnerships. And I've uh, also been chair of the PCS Trauma Injury and Burn Care Commission that was created to actually develop more programs in the field of injury prevention. I am also a senior fellow at the Philippine Public Safety College and continue to be a coordinator and teacher at the National Defense College for their Masters in National Security Administration. I've also had experiences as a visiting professor training young doctors in emergency medicine in University Kabangsa and Malaysia. And uh, was also the start of my career was being a technical uh, deputy secretary general for technical concerns of a great program of the late Secretary Flavier, the Stop Death Program, which is the precursor of the National Health Emergency Sur uh, Management Bureau right now. And I've had the opportunity to develop both the Trauma Fellowship Program in Surgery at the Philippine General Hospital and trained uh, hundreds of emergency medicine physicians who now lead many of the government hospitals. And I guess because of the work in COVID-19, I landed in a cover of a magazine. I never thought I'd be in the cover of a, of a magazine. It's league. It's for local government officials or public officials who actually take the lead. But two of my greatest memories is really being undersecretary and at that time, the lead for uh, the response of the Department of Health in Typhoon Haiyan. This is a picture of a hospital in Tacloban and a field international field hospital set up to operationalize the services there. This is another eerie picture because we were the only ones flying at the beginning of March of 2020 when COVID-19 lockdown was imposed by our government and we were going around all the hotspots in the different parts of the country. Of course, you get COVID, that's the occupational risk of being in the front lines. 
But let me talk to you about leadership. Leadership is not about a rank or a position. It is actually a choice and a choice to look after the person to the left of us and to the right of us. So all of you listening here are actually leaders in a sense. And in my years of practice, uh, from all those experiences, I now will enumerate some of the important principles that uh, we think are good, good tenets for leadership. One is being prepared. So the importance of pre prevention and preparation. If you want to take a leadership role, it requires developing very good preparedness and emergency response plans. In fact, one of the things I learned much later in the, with my boss, Secretary Galvez, he said, the, the first casualty in war is actually your plan. So it's actually also good that you also know how to do contingency planning. So more important than that, like any good athlete, you've got to practice those plans. You've got to do simulations and you should do, do them seriously, not just like uh, uh, because it's required, but because you want to know what impact it will have and how it can improve the way we respond in times of major disasters and chaos. And of course, the adage, prevention is better than cure is true in crisis leadership. You manage the risk, you do a crisis horizon mapping so that you, your crisis doesn't go into a catastrophe or a disaster. Another thing that's very important is that uh, managing emergencies is a team, team sport. And because of that, you have to have very clear roles and responsibilities. You have to have very good lines of communications and the procedures for resource allocation. This last part is very important. In any chaotic disaster, what is usually needed are resources and the, the, the methodology and how to move these resources quickly is how you will be judged on how you actually face that particular disaster. And again, not to overemphasize, underemphasize regular simulations, familiarize your teams with the plan to ensure smooth response. It's got to become muscle memory when a crisis occurs. Just some photos. Sometimes it's not, it's not also the words or not spoken. It's the non-physical communication that people actually convey when they are communicating. And we get to the second principle of what I talk about, which is risk communication. Very important is crisis communication, significance of very effective communication during, during a crisis, uh, reliability and timely communication channels. You can have good communications, but if they're late, it's totally useless. So you need to include everyone, all the stakeholders, citizens, emergency services, community organizations, and all other government agencies. And this is essential. It is essential that you, can, you, you have a good uh, reliability of uh, true, transparent, and accurate information. And this will only alleviate panic, build trust on the people manning and leading, and ensure coordinated efforts to manage the crisis effectively. So you've got to have also, as a leader, a crisis communications plan. And your crisis communications plan is actually very different. What you go up to policy leaders or people above you, what you present to strategic leaders of the different other agencies involved in the response, and then your tactical leaders or operation leaders that actually will deploy whatever plan you have. And of course, there's also a different crisis communication for media, for the public, and depending on the audience. And it's very important that we will use this communications plan also as a way to be able to monitor and evaluate the whole crisis as it happens. Also very important that crises are all complex. When there is an emergency or a disaster, the initial thing that happens is always chaos. And your job as the leader is to put order in that chaos and understand the simplicity in that complexity that you're handling. So no single entity can handle them alone. And this is why, in times of major calamities and disasters that was shown in the video, you always create task forces, multiple agencies that would have the same goal, but would come from different alliances and resources. Incident command systems, uh, systems wherein you're able to have common language to talk to each and every member of the task force. It's very important to foster strong partnerships. If you're not in the military sector, it's called partnership and collaboration with either your neighboring political jurisdictions or non-government organizations or the private sector, and more, most importantly, the community leaders where the people actually look up to for answers and solutions. So in a major disaster, it's always about pooling meager resources and sharing expertise, 
coordinating these efforts that can enhance our collective capacity to respond to crisis and meet the diverse needs of our community. So health leadership, what is this all about? This leadership extends beyond your administrative role. It embodies the art of inspiring and guiding diverse teams towards a common goal and the well-being of every individual, irrespective of their uh, socioeconomic background. Uh, also, in pers- I'll have to put in universal health coverage because I'm now Secretary of Health, the lucky Secretary of Health, to implement the Universal Health Care Act, which was passed in 2019 and was paused because of COVID-19. And in our pursuit of UHC, where quality health care is accessible and affordable for all, leadership becomes the beacon that illuminates the path forward. Leaders of within health systems, and that's every one of you who are healthcare workers, you are all leaders. You must exhibit an unwavering commitment to fostering collaboration and innovation. If you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result, you're wrong. You've got to start to innovate if something isn't working. So you've got to also get collaboration of the other stakeholders. You navigate through complexities, foster inter, uh, interdisciplinary cooperation, and harness the potential of technology to bridge all these gaps that we have, whether it's a disaster or the implementation of healthcare delivery systems. A true leader empowers frontline workers, acknowledges their invaluable contributions, and ensures their well-being for they are the lifeline of any healthcare systems or emergency response system. Health leadership involves advocating for equitable distribution of resources, whether on a day-to-day mode or on disaster mode, ensuring that the vulnerable, the most vulnerable, are not left behind. By fostering a culture of empathy and inclusivity, health leaders can help break down barriers that impede access to healthcare and medicines and services. This proactive stance is not only not only the strengthens, strengthening health systems in, in crisis, but it also echoes the principles of social justice that underpins what we do, what we want to achieve in universal healthcare. So as we envision a world where preventable diseases are minimized, where maternal and child health is prioritized, and where no one faces financial ruin due to medical expenses, health leadership takes on center stage. Effective leadership drives policy reforms, engages with stakeholders, and promotes transparent governance. Leadership paves the way for sustainable financing mechanisms that make UHC a reality rather than a distant dream. So in health leadership within the health systems, it will be our linchpin of progress towards attainment of universal health coverage. Health leadership embodies the values of compassion, collaboration, and vision, futures thinking, that are essential to creating a healthier and more equitable world. Let us all commit to cultivating and nurturing health leaders. Everyone listening now, I hope you will all be inspired that will steer us all towards the future where health is not a privilege, but a fundamental human right. So in health leadership, in the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction Management Framework, we emphasize the importance of cooperation, collaboration to achieve a common goal. And let me end by quoting a good friend of mine, Dr. Atul Gawande, in a uh, passage he wrote in the, in the book, in the second book he wrote, which is called Better. By the way, Atul Gawande is now the assistant administrator for global health and uh, is a general and endocrine surgeon at the Brigham Young Women and a professor at the Harvard Medical School and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. But I met him when he was still at Johns Hopkins. So we look at medicine as a field that uh, it's not all about procedure, but it is not. It is an imperfect science, an enterprise of constantly changing knowledge, uncertain information, fallible individuals, and at the same time, lives on the line. There is science in what we do, yes, but there is also habit, intuition, and sometimes plain old guessing. The gap between what we do and what we aim for persists, and this gap complicates everything we do. Maraming salamat po. Uh, this is our eight-point action agenda at the Department of Health, wherein we all aim to have a healthy Pilipinas kung saan bawat buhay mahalaga. 
Maraming salamat at mabuhay kayo, Susie and Raymond. Okay. Thank you so much. That's the, that was the Philippines Secretary of Health, Dr. Dr. Edi Herbosa. Not, not every day that we can get an audience to the Secretary of Health because of his busy schedule. So we really appreciate him being part of this webinar for today. And uh, thank you, sir, for your comprehensive presentation on principles of um, emergency health management and leadership. And we look forward to your presence in the live Q&A session later in the program. Dr. Susi. Okay, thank you so much, Secretary of Health, Ted Herbosa. Um, really speaking about something that he, he works on on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think setting the stage for the next set of speakers. And we are very privileged to have with us today somebody who I really admire a lot. She's a woman leader. She's phenomenal. And she's also very busy. So we are very fortunate to have her all the way from Guam. Let me introduce to you the Honorable Lourdes Leon Guerrero, the Guam Governor. Hi, Governor Lou. Have a day. <laughs> okay. Let me see. She's on mute. I think she'll unmute herself. There we go. Okay. Please unmute yourself, Governor. Okay, so Governor Lou has just come out of a very what should I say, a very trying period where they didn't have electricity for, I don't know, what was it, Governor Lu, three or four weeks when Guam was hit by a super typhoon war. And, and uh, I, I was there after and I just saw how terrible it was. But here she is and uh, going strong and ready to share some insights with us. Welcome, Dr. Lu, please take the floor. Governor Lu, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Susie. I think we are having a video before I speak. Okay, yes. very much. Half a day in Mabuhay from Guam. I'm Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, and I'm delighted to join so many of our global partners to engage in Health Lead, an international dialogue series for health initiatives. As leaders in our respective regions, we all have something in common. We all share the utmost desire to serve our people. As medical professionals, we aim to heal the sick and save lives. 
As teachers, we aim to educate and empower the next generation with knowledge and build understanding and empathy. And as elected officials, we aim to create and execute policies and programs that uplift our people and raise their quality of life. But as we're seeing throughout the world, our respective missions have only become more challenging as our families and the communities we serve have been devastated by disaster, which is why we're here today. Bringing our best practices to the discussion, we are supporting our resiliency initiatives and empowering one another to restore normalcy more expeditiously post-disaster for future events. For Guam, we have much to learn today, but also so much to share as a result of our most recent calamity, Typhoon Mawar. Mawar was the first major typhoon to hit our island in over two decades. Mawar made landfall just over three months ago. Winds measured up to 140 miles per hour, gusts up to 170 miles per hour. The destructive winds and rains persisted overnight, taking out power lines, water wells, and telecommunications for the majority of our island residents. President Biden, per my request, declared Guam a major disaster area, which activated hundreds of FEMA officials and their federal partners and millions in federal dollars to support our response and recovery efforts. Fortunately, there were no casualties, no lives were lost. And compared to past typhoons, fewer homes and families were left in shambles. That's because our past experiences taught us well. The people of Guam are no strangers to major weather events. As we speak, we're in a typhoon season, which for us in the Pacific is June through December. Our older generations will tell you the horror stories of Typhoon Karen in 1962, Typhoon Pamela in 1976, Typhoon Omar in 1992, Typhoon Paka in 1997, and Typhoon Pong Sung Wah in 2002. With wind spe speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour, these typhoons literally flatten our islands early infrastructure and landscape. Since then, our government and our people have made major investments to spare us the hardships and the heartache that come with picking up the pieces. We've hardened our homes with concrete instead of wood. And the same for utility poles. Our people are also well-trained to put up our typhoon shutters fill up our gas tanks and prepare our generators in the event we are left in the dark. These investments and training paid off to an extent. At first light, our crew, crews cleared the streets to enable first responders to get to and from the hospital and to support utility crews in their restoration efforts. Within days, our public hospital, airport, and port had their power and water restored. This meant no disruption in services for our sick and minimal disruption to commerce and travel. It also spread, it also spared us any health crisis and food supply issues. Our government, with the support of our major uh, mayors in our villages, federal partners, and nonprofit organizations provided for our vulnerable. Water bladders were positioned north, central, and south to support those without running water. Thousands of food bags were distributed island-wide. Emergency shelters were opened and operating 24-7, providing medical services and hot meals twice daily. We also provided free trash pickup and waived costs for transfer stations for all residents. This enabled families to rid their homes of moldy furniture and carpets, spoiled food, and other hazardous waste. In addition to trash pickup, we opened typhoon debris sites where residents could dispose of their trash, everything from green waste to e-waste in support of their recovery and sanitation efforts. This prevented spread of disease and infection. 
Today, there's minimal evidence of Typhoon Mawar. Power and water is restored. Our people are back to work. And tourism is making a strong comeback. What's left is the uprooted trees and the trash sites, which are currently being mulched for proper disposal. And while our response was good, it was far from perfect. As we have in past typhoons, our people cope with losing running water and power. We would not, however, cope with loss of communications. Due to advancements in modern technology, most homes no longer have battery operated radios, radios or landline phones because we've grown dependent on WhatsApp and social media for information sharing. Without power, our telecommunications sector struggle to keep phone and data services operable. Depending on your carrier and your location, you likely had little to no access to working phone or internet, myself included. For days, our radio were radio silent due to missing or damaged antennas. Our news media partners were also unable to broadcast for the same reasons. Even our emergency radio station was inoperable. Despite the best efforts of our Joint Information Center to collect and disseminate verified information, they were left with limited platforms to do so. They sent out press releases and announcements hourly and manned phone lines 24 seven to answer questions. But this valuable information had a limited audience. To correct this, we are working closely with our telecoms partners and our utility agencies. Just as we restored the hospital, airport and port, we must prioritize power restoration to buildings that support tower equipment. We also must prioritize their access to fuel. Bigger picture thinking, Guam is in a very unique position. As the tip of the spear and a key player in the defense of the United States, we can request more for investments towards hardening our critical infrastructure for both natural and man-made emergency. These requests are well underway. Until then, it's back to basics. With our growing dependence on technology, we must embrace traditional low-tech communications to get information disseminated and alleviate fear within our community. Lessons learned. When phones and radios are down, we must revert to broadcasting announcements using a vehicle with a PA system traversing up and down our villages. We can also distribute printed materials and pamphlets at sites. Residents typically turn to light their mayor's office. We must also make greater investments towards putting power poles underground, but this is a bigger conversation for a different group of stakeholders. Other small tips that go along the way, have an emergency plan, dust off the battery operated radios or get one for your home, invest in candles and flashlights, Fill your pantry with non-perishable goods and ensure you have enough drinking water for your family in addition to water in catchments to collect water for flushing toilets. Pull cash out from the ATM for purchasing goods when the power is out and buy good old fashioned playing cards, board games and other, other ways to keep you and your family entertained. Also, Invest in mosquito coil and mosquito repellent to prevent the, the spread of disease like dengue. And invest in a generator if it's in your budget, if at least to support food preservation. Again, it's back to basics. In closing, Guam has weathered many typhoons and this last one only truly tested and proved our resilience. We are blessed to live in a community that doesn't loot or steal in times of catastrophe, but one that comes together to support one another in difficult times and hardships. But we couldn't have done it alone. We leaned on our federal partners and nonprofits to support emergency shelters, housing repairs, and financial aid programs. 
due to our isolated location, we also had to outsource valuable human resources and tools like linemen and bucket trucks, which took time and delayed our restoration efforts. But overall, we spared health crisis by ensuring water and power were restored to our hospital promptly after the storm cleared. And we minimized the spread of disease and infection by making trash disposal easy and accessible for all. Our biggest shortcomings were a direct result of our dependence on technology. But as stated earlier, it's back to basis. Thank you, Sidus Masi and Maraming Salamat Po. Thank you so much. It was an honor and pleasure, Governor Lu. Uh, we learned a lot on your presentation. Very, very excellent presentation on Guam's disaster preparedness, response, and recovery as it pertains to Super Typhoon Mawar. And I cannot help but uh, take away your uh, that phrase on uh, going back to basics and really making sure that we're resilient despite uh, those uh, circumstances, uh, that prolonged circumstances in, in the case of Guam. Thank you so much. And we look forward to your participation during the live Q&A session. Dr. Susie. Thank you very much, Governor Lu. Amazing presentation. I mean, you'll see all the hearts and clapping on the uh, the emoticons and, of course, the appreciation of our audience. But I thought that was really an excellent presentation. And really, the way you described it, we can almost see, you know, what you were doing, what you had to go through. And like like Raymond, I I really, the, 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 that phrase, back to basics, particularly in relation to communication, I think that that really stuck. Thank you so much, Governor Lou. We'll have you in a bit for our question and answers. And then, uh, okay, so now we are very fortunate to have with us, oh my goodness, in the in the heat of, uh, what should I say, in the, in the, not in the heat, at the center of um, public attention in the past few weeks. We have seen and heard about the fires in Maui, in Lahaina, and we're very fortunate to have a speaker coming from the state of Hawaii to talk about this. He is... Uh, the deputy chair of the Board of Agriculture in Hawaii, and he is also the head of the Plant Industry Administration. I've known him for some time, and he was working on um, farm to school programs for a long time. So I know his heart is really there in taking care of the environment and feeding the people. But now, in his new role, he has had to deal with some of the issues and challenges of recovery in Lahaina. So very, very happy to welcome to our program, Dexter Kishida. Dex, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Susan. Pleasure to be here. Honored with this amazing panel that, that you've put together. Um, and I do want to say that we've been really, really blessed in timing of having a governor who's an emergency room doctor. Right. And so his ability to make very quick decisions and educated decisions in a time of crisis has been um, absolutely essential. Uh, and through this, though, and I'll start the screen share. Um, through this, really, one of the important pieces is, and I won't you know, reiterate too much of what our honorable panel has said so far, is really the keeping things in order and knowing whose role is what. And in Hawaii, we really want the folks on the ground to be lead and, and make those decisions. So our county of Maui has really uh, stepped up to take that role. But to take a step back in the conversation, um, Hawaii is going through some pretty significant drought with an El Nino season, uh, decent winds, you know, so very low rains during the summer, um, many areas around the island chain has suffered from pretty high risk uh, of wildfires. Then we had uh, notice of a hurricane that, that was headed our way. We thought it's going to pass quite a few hundred miles south of us, some, some wind warnings. But I must say, I don't think we thought that the um, intense and immense uh, wildfire that West Maui, upcountry Maui, and the Big Island suffered 
um, you know, would, would have occurred. Not, not in recent or recorded history has something like this happened. Partly it's because it's the, the horrible, perfect storm, not to have the horrible correlation, but the perfect storm of the changing climate and um, all of these, this disaster happening because of that. So as you can see in the next slide, you know, we've, we had a community that was absolutely devastated um, by, by the wildfires and in some way has dwarfed some of the other areas around the island chain that also suffered. We, some of our, or much, or many areas in upcountry Mali on the mountainside also suffered from wildfires uh, in the form of burning some of our ag sector, uh, ranch land, and some other uh, production facilities. And one area that is absolutely crippled is Maui's coffee industry. And while, while some folks may definitely survive off of coffee, um, it, is, it is an economic driver along with tourism. So definitely a challenge as, as we work towards recovery. And three weeks into this disaster, um, you know, we are only now reaching a stage that that we apologies for the for the background noise. Um, we're only now at a stage that we're starting the cleanup. So FEMA is helping uh, along with the EPA to start the hazardous waste cleanup because the wildfires just tore through. You'll see the amount of cars and homes that were absolutely destroyed. But in that, things like batteries um, and other potentially hazardous materials left behind. So many of your folks haven't even gotten the chance to go back to their homes or businesses to even attempt cleanup or to see if anything survived. But one of the things that I must say has been a challenge is communication. Not only because communication lines were down, but when in the era of social media, maybe the opposite. Sometimes things come out too quickly and they're not able to be vetted by the general public on whether things are true or not. So as, as the Dr. Herbosa said, um, timely accurate information is really, really key, but also needing the ability to quiet some of the outside noise that happens. And one thing that we've seen as well as other areas that have seen absolute devastation is that during these situations, mental health is another key concern that yes, ensuring that the physical health of our people are, the, are taken care of, that we got them food and clothing and shelter, mental health has been an area that um, we've also needed to ensure people are taken care of. And through this time, um, we're going through the through the range of emotions from disbelief and then now anger, quite frankly, and trying to find what is the cause of all this? What is the meaning behind it all? So one of the key pieces through this really early stages of recovery is partnering with community and, um, and, and being able to provide hope for the people. One of the areas, and, and this is a banyan tree that has been around forever, uh, generations, and it was severely burned and has been one of the focal points to really keep alive, not only physically keep alive, but to keep alive the hope that um, of the Lahaina community. And symbolizes, I think, really well and has become the symbol of just how both private sector, public sector can work together to keep our to help our communities recover. Because sometimes government can't, can't move as quickly or may be encumbered by rules or regulations that prohibit just easy use. And one great example is clothing distribution. If we were to have to do this, we'd have to ensure the clothing is, is uh, you know, washed and laundered and, and then given out, which would take extra time versus the private sector can definitely move quickly and get clothing out to these individuals who lost everything very, very quickly. And then there's also food. And one thing, and, and 
I, I'm also stepping in in one of our other panelists that couldn't make it because he's on the ground in Maui setting up another facility today. But Chad Buck, the president of Hawaii Food Service Alliance, um, has been a key responder and very quickly within hours getting food on the ground or additional food on the ground in Maui for the folks that um, have, have been absolutely devastated through the wildfires. One of the things that he has been a leader on is pre-positioning food rations across the state. And so setting up pre-covery pods where it's a 40 foot container filled with 135,000 meals that will be ready for, ready for distribution. In some cases like a hurricane, pre-positioning and pre-distributing food or in cases like this, having the ability to already distribute uh, very quickly freeze-dried meals along with water bladders to the community members. And so ensuring that, that we can respond with the basic needs quickly, then working on housing and mental health services for our families. We're also at a point that, or there were a few schools that were absolutely uh, devastated, totally burnt. And so working with families to restore a sense of normalcy to their families and getting them um, back to school and ensuring support services are there for the families because this truly has been an absolute, as any natural disaster, very traumatic experience. And with the high winds that, that we're expecting, not necessarily 90 miles an hour, but still high winds that we're expecting uh, through the weekend and the very dry weather. Um, and there was a flare up or actually a fire just recently. And so in the emergency alarms, when sirens went off, um, quite frankly, triggering a lot of folks of what just happened to ensure that, that there are supports in the community to, to be there for, through, through all of the, uh, through the next months and even years as we rebuild. Another piece to it all on the recovery side is being very culturally sensitive and ensuring that we engage the people. One thing we've learned over and over is that moving quickly is important, but moving together is just as important. That it's not just government leaders that are gonna make decisions, but the community that will help make those key decisions in restoring Lahaina back to its glory. So one of the takeaways that, and again, it's very early in, in, the, in these August wildfires, some of the takeaways that, that we really have is ensuring communication goes out and finding ways to ensure true, accurate information is released to our, our communities. The governor has committed and is, does an excellent job at doing using social media to clear up any misconceptions and, and share where we're at. And the other piece is engaging community and community organizations to respond along with government to respond to the needs of our, of our community members. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Dexter. Learned a lot about uh, Hawaii and uh, your presentation really uh, opened up at least uh, in, in my perception because I haven't been to Hawaii and really getting to know about uh, aspects on food food security, resiliency, climate change, very, very important in today's context. Uh, please join us during the live Q&A session later in the program. Uh, for our final speaker, Dr. Susie. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Dex. That was wonderful. I think you're able to weave in so many, um, so many components of the response in Hawaii that I think are relevant to all everyone who lives in the Pacific. So I think this is this is this is really good, and we're looking forward to having you on the Q and A. All right, our final speaker was is the former Secretary of Health, who was Assistant Secretary of Health during Typhoon Haiyan, and she has since then been working with the Philippine Red Cross and in the communities, um, doing primary health care, supporting human resource development. I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Pauline Ogiel. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you, Susie, and thank you, Raymond, for this opportunity to share my experience during Typhoon Haiyan response. And 
many of the lessons learned actually was uh, already mentioned by uh, Secretary Ted Herbosa. He was under secretary during that time. And of course, uh, the recent experience of Guam um, shared to us by Governor Lu, and uh, it has a similar situation as Typhoon Haiyan. Uh, unfortunately, we have not experienced wildfires as Hawaii had experienced it recently. So I will share with you some of the things we did on the ground and the general principles were already mentioned by uh, Secretary Ted Herbosa. So in the response, what was uh, very critical uh, as a leader on the ground for me was to ensure the hospitals were running, the rural health units were open and addressing patients, and the homes were safe and free from disease. So day-to-day uh, -day operations was really a challenge as uh, mentioned uh, by Governor Lu, the lines were down, communications was down, water, uh, electricity, and even supply chain, even fuel was unavailable in the locality. So what you need to do as a leader, health emergency leader, was to bring in all those supplies and to ensure the lifelines are reconnected. So on a day-to-day -day operations, I was there in Haiyan in Tacloban City. Uh, I had to ensure medical supplies were uh, coming in because all the supplies left in the hospital was actually unusable. They were flooded. And so we had to bring in, fly in almost all our supplies. And we cannot do bidding or procurement. So what we did was to contact the nearby tertiary hospitals of the Department of Health and just give them a list of the things we needed. And then they brought that in to the, uh, the hospital within 24 hours. And then aside from supplies, we also had to ensure we had medical staff. And the people in uh, Tacloban were victims of the typhoon. So you don't expect them to report to the hospital every day. And many of the doctors, nurses were really unable to report. So what we did was to send out teams from Metro Manila hospitals or other hospitals. And it's a complete team. They have nurses, doctors, all familiar with each other. So every 10 days, we had a new set of uh, staff in the Tacloban City uh, Medical Center. Then aside from that, we also learned that it's not only the doctors, the nurses, the health professionals that you need. You need utility workers, the ones that clean the hospital, the carpenters, the plumbers, the electricians. So even that we had to get from the other hospitals of the DOH and we rotated the personnel, the utility personnel. And uh, mind you, one very important concern at that time was the ATM was down, the communications were down, the banks were closed. So, But it was uh, really imperative that we provide salaries nonstop. So we even have to resort to physically withdrawing the money in Cebu City, that's the nearby province, and then fly it into Tacloban and just provide like, 10,000 for every personnel and then just uh, fix the records after a month or so. And then identify disease outbreaks. Actually, when I came into Tacloban, there was no concrete plan like uh, um, uh, do this, do that, vaccinations, immunizations, etc. So what we did was to meet the uh, healthcare workers on the ground every day, what's the disease? What are you seeing? So 
when somebody reports a tetanus case, so we immediately mobilized all the healthcare workers and said, vaccinate everyone with tetanus toxoid to prevent tetanus. Because we don't know which individuals really had wounds during the uh, onslaught of the storm surge. And maybe the wounds are now healed. So everybody was vaccinated. Then we had a case of leptospirosis. So um, they were jaundiced and uh, had to undergo um, uh, dialysis. So we realized that all these people were exposed to uh, leptospirosis because flooding was all over. There was a storm surge. So we provided prophylaxis to everyone uh, during that time. And uh, we had bloody diarrhea. We responded. I, I think what's uh, important is the communications. Immediately, we informed the community through radio, through uh, loudspeaker, the boil your water, chlorinate your water. If you are having diarrhea, go to the nearest health center to get the antibiotics and medications. Then we also immediately uh, uh, vaccinated against uh, measles, all children in the evacuation centers below 15 years old and gave vitamin A capsules. So uh, those were standards. And all teams coming to the ground zero where the typhoon hit, they have to have resources to feed themselves and to be self-contained during the time that they are assigned there. Because we told them nobody will take care of you. You have to take care of yourselves. And also the drugs and medicines they need to treat the patients, they should also have that ready and brought in. Because we cannot worry about what they need aside from worrying about the hospitals. And what was critical at that time was the guidelines for foreign missions. So there were a lot of volunteers from other countries coming in, and we had to set up our desk at the airport so that we know who are coming in, what is the level of capacity they're bringing in. Are they a field hospital? Are they a cleanup team or just uh, providing meals? So everything was mapped out. How many hospitals were destroyed and how many teams are available? So we match one team per hospital. And uh, our DOH hospital, EVRMC, that's the Eastern Visayas Regional Medical Center, we never closed during the whole time. So even if rainwater was coming into the corridors, the floors were muddy, we were open 24-7. And logistics is very important, as mentioned by Governor Lu. We had to bring in genset. Okay, generators we lent to private hospitals so they can start operations. Water bladders, food, oxygen tanks, computers, respirators, even portable OR equipment. So it came from nearby regions. And one team, one hospital or community. So for example, ARMM team, the Muslim team, we assign them in one rural health unit. You cannot like uh, spread out the people in so many areas, including repairs of facility. So even if they are doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers, they have to have a hammer ready, paint brushes ready, and do the repair work while they are attending to the patients. All cases were paid for by PhilHealth, uh, admitted to the hospital, but uh, we asked PhilHealth to pay the hospital and not the Department of Health, even if we provided the human resources and even the uh, supplies. It's to build up and start up the hospital so that they can uh, uh, build back better and 
finally, uh, we operated seven private hospitals because at that time, I said, if only the DOH hospital was open, we cannot attend to all the patients, particularly cesarean sections or appendectomy. So one by one, we opened all the private hospitals. They were manned by DOH uh, healthcare workers and foreign workers, and we supplied the uh, drugs, medicines, and small equipment. So this is how we looked after two years after Typhoon Haiyan. This is how we it was after five years. We have a new hospital in a new site. Hopefully it won't be uh, damaged by storm surge anymore in Tacloban. And these are the people and staff that survived Typhoon Haiyan. And resilience is the name of the game, Build Back Better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Paul. Um, very, very thankful for your sharing of your experiences, uh, practical tips that uh, that everyone was uh, able to learn from, especially during the Haiyan. Uh, that bit about uh, withdrawing money from Cebu and then flying into Tacloban, very, very difficult. Uh, I could just imagine how it would be. I mean, if if it were um, replicable, if if it did happen in other parts of the country. Okay, Dr. Susie. Thank you so much, Secretary Pauline Rubiel. That was wonderful, I think. Um, you were probably remembering everything while you were telling the story, but I guess there are really so many lessons that we have learned from our speakers today, and we'd like to thank them in advance. We're going to honor your time, and we're not going to go over time. So we will have a few more minutes for uh, for a brief uh, Q&A. But before that, Raymond, do you want to acknowledge some of, some of the places where people are watching from? Go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Susie, for, for today's webinar. Obviously, we have <clears throat> local viewers all the way from Bataan, from Manila, from Los Baños, from Paranaque, from uh, Mandaluyong Ortigas, um, University of Rizal System Health Services Unit. Thank you so much. From Cavite, from Deca Homes Loma de Gato in Marilao, Bulacan. Maraming maraming salamat po. <clears throat> Those who are joining us all the way from RPHS Annex 1, Antipolo City, uh, from IFRC, Philippine Country Delegation. Thank you so much. Those who are joining us from the Department of Pathology, Laboratory Medicine and Molecular Diagnostic in Bulacan Medical Center. Maraming maraming salamat po. Hospital ng Binyan in Laguna. Thank you so much. Those who are joining us from Ilo, Ilo City, from Davao City, all across the Philippines, thank you, thank you. Hospital ng Imus Public Health Unit in Cavite, maraming maraming salamat po. Those joining us from the Philippine General Hospital as well, uh, from UP Diliman, those joining us from uh, international. So we have one from, so from Maui, from uh, the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Uh, very recently was an affiliation of uh, Dr. Susie from New Sinai School and Colleges. Thank you so much. From Guam, uh, locally from Eastern Visayas uh, as well. From Hawaii, obviously, from Malolos Bulacan, USA Hospital, uh, ENT HNS Center. Thank you so much. Uh, from University of Ha'il in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. Very, very uh, much appreciate your participation in our webinar for today. So uh, we'd like to ask everyone to open up their video cameras, uh, but, bef but while they're doing that, we'll take a very quick station break, uh, care of TVUP. <laughs> Feed your utak. <laughs> Very cute. This is the first time I've seen it. Thank you, TVUP. That's so cute. So let's ask uh, all our speakers to open their 
open their videos and I think we'll just do one question because I said I don't want, you know, we, we want to honor everyone's time and our guests are really so busy. So the first question is a simple one. And I think the question is, um, you are all very resilient leaders and you've been through very difficult times. So what do you think is the previous experience or event in your life that prepared you to handle what you just handled. So in resiliency, we think about drawing on our previous experience to help us navigate the future. So question is, as you think about what you just went through, what was the event that prepared you for this? Or who was the person who prepared you for this? Or what was the situation that made you ready for a very unpredictable course of events. So we'll start with um, Secretary Ubial. Pao, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think working in the rural areas, in the field where the resources are very meager and starting to like uh, make do with what you have and try to improve the health system with very minimal resources was what helped me to the the high end response. Yeah, so you weren't you weren't looking for complicated things. No, you could no. You could manage. It was the basic things that were important and how to get those things immediately into the situation because we had money, we had cash advance in our pockets, but there was no uh, means of getting fuel, food for the 300 patients in the hospital. So that was really the challenge. So I started calling on the nearby um, health leaders to bring in all those supplies within 24 hours. Wonderful. Dexter, how about you? You were just, you know, you were, uh, Dexter and I were having a conversation the other day and he said he was looking for feed for the animals. I want to say something about that, but Still answer the question, Dex. What sure. has prepared you for this experience? Actually, it's all it's all all together. Um, one of the kind of unexpected things is uh, there's a lot of ranch land that was burned. And so we needed to find foster homes or foster homes for cows and horses and large animals were needed to both get them quickly off the land, but then we're, there's no, no grasses available, et cetera. So we needed to ship and feed. So I think one of the things that I find ready to us is the relationship building over the years, because that is truly the way we're surviving. It's making connections with folks on the continental U.S. or even here on other islands that have access and had ability to ship over from Kauai very quickly. So a neighbor island, within a day or so, we could get uh, some hay. And then while we're positioning from the continent to US, some alfalfa, um, and, and those relationships where we could pick up the call within hours, or pick up the phone within hours to call were absolutely essential. And then maybe the second part is, as working in food systems and thinking about how do we build a sustainable food system, redundancy is something that keeps coming up. How do we build the redundancy in in ensuring that if one section or one sector goes down, that we can pivot to another. But even that falls back to relationship building. So treating people nicely and making friends, <laughs> kindergarten maybe, what we learned in kindergarten prepared me for what we're going through now. Thank you very much, Dexter. Okay, let's go to Governor Lou. Governor, you're yes, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, you know, for me, it's my experience uh, through my nursing education and through my nursing work in uh, ICU, CCU, and ER. Um, and, you know, what Dr. Uh, Herbosa was saying about uh, a leader is someone that takes chaos and organizes chaos. And um, uh, I think. Uh, with my experience in very critical care areas of healthcare, 
uh, has given me that confidence and that um, strength, I think, uh, uh, to not panic in a crisis situation and how you have to remain calm and how you have to always, always assess situations for their quick changes of circumstances and how you have to quickly respond to those changes of circumstances and to be able to, you know, to be able to also listen to uh, other people and hear their ideas and, and their information. But my experience as a nurse working uh, in a very, you know, science data, data environment and the uh, quickness of uh, response, otherwise you could lose somebody's life or you could be the cause of someone losing their life. So in those situations, you know, I remain very calm, very uh, methodical, very uh, uh, thinking, uh, although sometimes it's hard, but uh, you need to do that. Don't panic, <laughs> don't panic. So. <laughs> I also wanted to say to um, Mr. Casita that I know your governor very well, Governor Green, and I just want to please relate to him and I, I do text him, thank him for his help uh, with us during Typhoon Mawar and I have offered my help also to him in, in terms of uh, deploying our National Guard to help uh, in, in in the cleanup and the recovery and even just the work involved to get things straight. So uh, that's that's been what's been um, my thing is uh, my, my experience and my education uh, and my uh, working in the healthcare area, especially in the critical care areas, that's always crisis, yeah. Thank you very much, Governor Lou. Secretary Herbosa, Ted, please go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, our experiences, Susie, the emergency department of the Philippine General Hospital. Uh, when I was yeah. a medical student, I I took an elective in emergency department in the emergency year. When I was a surgical resident, my most loved rotation was being in the emergency department as a surgeon on duty. That means I took on all cases. Uh, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, uh, acute abdomen, and you had to move very quickly or else the patient died. And I had the same experience as governor. I think that's exactly where we learn these principles. And that's why I developed the specialty of emergency medicine in the Philippines, because I think the Philippines as a disaster-prone country would benefit from the things we learn on how we behave and function in an emergency department. But uh, one more comment other than that is that uh, I, I I know after Typhoon Haiyan, we've developed our own health emergency team that goes abroad. In fact, we sent our team to Turkey and there were lessons there because they couldn't handle the cold. It was minus four degrees, but we learned our lessons. We sent a team. This is the first time. Uh, well, we've sent teams to other countries, but now it's a formal team. I was just wondering, I wasn't secretary of health then. Why didn't the Philippines send a team? I know we only sent money has helped to Guam. We should have sent a team as well to Guam and help them. And I think that's that's an action that we missed. We should have done that. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Okay, thank you so much. I think through this little conversation, we now have a network of um, leaders who are going to help each other. And I wish we had more time. I think we can go on and on. And there's so much to say, but we have to close our meeting today. And i just like to thank all our speakers. Um, for the time, for the insight, and for what you do for people, even when others are not watching. Thank you so much. We have picked up from Ted. I love the thing about the first casualty is your plan. Love, that. <laughs> love it. I mean, that, that's that's really true. The story, right? You know, and um, Governor Lou was talking about back to basics, looking at the very simple things we can do, like um, having some playing cards around or stocking up on um you know on food or water that you need i think with dexter moving quickly is not as important as moving together and pauline for all of your insights on being resourceful and having to deal with something big with nothing in your hands except your own resourcefulness and resilience so thank you very much everyone we'll have to close our webinar now and i'm turning over to raymond raymond go ahead 
Thank you so much to our panel and Dr. Susie. Uh, really for a very lively Q&A, even if it's short. And hopefully this will be just the first of many of our international dialogue series, Health Lead. And we are confident that our global audience who have benefited from everyone's presentations, have greatly enriched our knowledge, fostered meaningful discussions, and enhanced international collaboration. So this formally closes the first Health Leadership in Action or Health Lead our international dialogue series here in Stop COVID Deaths. We look forward to your company next Friday for our regular programming on Stop COVID Deaths. And we'll see you again with another episode of Health Lead next month, uh, October 1st, with an international take on health leadership, shortage of nurses, midwives, and community health. So with Health Lead, let's collaborate, communicate, and cooperate.